of our speakers are currently with the American Economic Liberties Project, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that aims to build momentum towards concrete, wide-ranging policy changes to address the problem of corporate consolidation. Morgan is a senior advisor, and Pat is the director of, of state and local policy. Morgan Harper is also a Columbus resident. She's the founder of the grassroots organization Columbus Stand Up. She was previously a candidate to represent Ohio's third congressional district. Uh, she was also a vice president at Local Initiative Support Co 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 Corporation and also worked at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as a senior advisor to the first director. Pat is also the author of The Billionaire Boondoggle, How Our Politicians Let Corporations and Bigwits Steal Our Money and Jobs. Uh, and that's a book that's not only topically related, but it's also available through the library. So be sure to check that one out. Uh, he's also the author of the Boondoggle Newsletter on Substack. He was previously a journalist and editor at U.S. News and World Report, Think Progress, and TalkPoverty.org. So thank you so much to both Pat and to Morgan for joining us this evening, and I will let the two of you take it from here. Great. Well, thank you so much, Beth and Leanne, for having us in, in the Bexley Public Library community. Um, I'm really excited. Beth's not, or sorry, Pat's not a, um, a Columbus native or resident, but you know, having lived here and also grown up going to the Bexley Library, I'm, I'm very excited about this presentation. So getting to blend professional life with um, regular life is, is cool. Um, so we're going to be talking about you know, what our organization focuses on, but I first just wanted to um, give a little bit of context as to how I even came to work at the American Economic Liberties Project. Hopefully some of you have heard of me before because the third district does include Bexley. So if you didn't, like shame on my campaign, but that's a whole nother story. Um, but you know, really it was during the campaign, I found that it was very interesting. A core tenant of our campaign was that I wasn't taking any money from corporations, no PAC money. And I would sometimes get people that would ask, and it was always, you know, it was, like I said, very interesting. They're like, well, but Morgan, you know, you're getting people that are donating to you from California and giving you $500 or $1,000. And isn't that all kind of the same thing? And I found that intriguing because it was actually, well, well, no, like that's, that's really not the same thing. And the difference there, that's a power difference, right? Like my friend who lives in California, even if they have the ability to give me $500, you know, and, and their name isn't Mark Zuckerberg, like they can't actually control a market, right? Like that's unlikely. And so, you know, that's the difference between like a corporation that is giving these donations and also able to control a market, very, very distinct from an individual from a power perspective. And if that's not clear to the general public, then we have an educational challenge on our hands. And so that's what brought me ultimately to the American Economic Liberties Project is that that's what we're focused on is really educating people about some of these power dynamics that are at play in our markets and our politics and helping um, the public and our, our leaders and elected officials to understand that. So, um, okay, so we're gonna get started the presentation, although I don't know why this is, okay, cool, there we go. Uh, so one way that we like to think about this is a quote that we have here from a former long ago Supreme Court justice, but a real pillar of um, some of these, you know, economic uh, empowerment and also antitrust issues. So the quote here, we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. And, you know, why we like to talk about this quote is it really gets at this, this issue. It's that we're talking about democracy in the markets and the commercial sector and also this political sector. And democracy ultimately depends on all of us, individual citizens, having the power to um, over our lives and, you know, having freedom, but also like the wherewithal to engage in the democratic process. But the more that we have a few people that are controlling the economic side of things and also able to leverage that power, over the de democracy side of things, um, we're really getting quite far away from what we claim our country is about. And so as an organization, we're focused on trying to disperse that economic power that really helps to then feed our larger democratic project. And, and, and we would say and posit, and we you know, look forward to the discussion um, to hear from other folks, but we're at a bit of a crisis moment with that, that we do have extreme concentration of economic power and it is a threat, a real live threat to our democracy as well. So how do we know we have this concentration crisis? What's, what's the evidence for that? Um, really it's all around us. And you know, we would say like in every, in every sector, there's been a tremendous amount of consolidation within these markets. So 
Big tech is one we're going to talk a little bit more about today, and it's in the news a lot right now, but look around telecommunications, banking, hospitals, contracting, defense contracting, pharmaceuticals, retail. There's been a tremendous amount of consolidation over my lifetime, you know, about a generation that tracks with some of the changes in, um, in our courts and, and uh, within policymakers. So you see now four airlines controlling 76% of the domestic market. We have some of these stats here. Um, three corporations controlling 75% of American beer market, four corporations making 89% of baby formula. And even in very new markets, you know, in Google and Facebook and the digital ad revenue market, that ha there's been a tremendous, you know, acceleration of consolidation very quickly where they're controlling 60% of digital ad revenue. So it's really more the challenge to identify a market where there hasn't been consolidation, you know, I would say, than, um, than trying to uh, figure out where it might be. And so just to you know, add some more color to that point, we, and we actually have a full document on our website that's called this illusion of choice um, to help understand you know, what the landscape looks like. And even if we think we might have competitive markets, it, there's actually like usually a large conglomerate that's behind it. So you know, taking one brand that I'm sure a lot of us are aware of, Expedia, the travel search site, um, you know, I know, I know, well, actually, when I started, you know, first traveling and, and looking for deals, especially as, as a student, I would try to shop between these different sites. But, you know, what we're showing here is that Expedia has actually acquired a lot of the brands that we used to shop between. And, and really, even if you think these are different companies, they're all, they're all under the same conglomerate. So here we have Orbitz, Travelocity, Hotwire, all within that tra travel um, space are ultimately owned by the same company. And they've they've been able to acquire and, and grow their market power. Um, and then also entering into you know, adjacent markets. So like the car rental search market and also hotel search on, on the internet. You know, those are also brands that they now own like hotels.com. And the other thing that I would wanna draw everybody's attention to here is that lobbying. So can you see what I do? Yeah, the lobbying budget here. And we're gonna talk a lot about this, right? It's again, it's this, it's this connection between the influence in the markets and the power and dominance in markets that that is leveraged over the political system. Uh, lobbying is certainly one way that that happens. And you can see here Expedia having a $13.1 million federal lobbying budget. So that's getting back to, so it's not just the individual PAC contributions either. It's also you know, the fact that there's money spent on employing people to be in touch with our governmental players and influence their decision-making. And another example we have here, but like I said, this is across a lot of markets. And if you go to our site, there's more information on this. Um, I included Anheuser-Busch InBev here because we have a local example of this uh, that I think is pretty interesting. If folks have been following the news about Platform Beer Company, which I actually thought was a locally owned company, but about a week ago, their employees walked out. They walked out because they weren't being treated um, safely, they thought, you know, in terms of like notification around other employees who had gotten COVID and also that their wages haven't been fair during the, this pandemic period. And so that is an interesting story because you might think like, oh, well, it's just, you know, 10 employees that are talking to a founder, a local founder, and that can be a very direct and, and fair conversation. But this is what those platform employees are actually up against. They're up against a giant in the Anheuser-Busch InBev Corporation that acquired the platform beer company. And so this again is just demonstrating the level of um, you know, really extreme market power within this industry like we had referenced before. And a lot of brands that we might think of as distinct companies are, are actually part of the same conglomerate. And again, just pointing to the, the federal lobbying budget, you know, over $44 million for Anheuser-Busch InBev. So um, a lot of money spent on talking to the government. So why does this matter? Um, and, and this is, you know, again, one of the really interesting things to me and why you know, I was so excited to, to work at American Economic Liberties Project um, is a lot of the issues that we spend a lot of time, I would say we as citizens who care a lot about, you know, especially here in Columbus, I think we care a lot about making sure others are okay. And um, a lot of the issues that we tend to focus on have this consolidation uh, problem behind them. And so, you know, driving inequality, the Federal Reserve has done research showing how much this corporate concentrated corporate power is connected to larger issues of wealth inequality, but also regional inequality. And Pat's going to talk, you know, about this, like how we see a lot of growth and 
affluence in, in, on the coast and, and even you know, in Columbus compared to other parts of Ohio, for example. So, um, but not so much as the same opportunity that's spread across states evenly. That, that is a, a big issue that a lot of folks are focused on now. Uh, lower wages, you know, the fact that we have this concentration means that people aren't necessarily getting paid as much, even though median annual comp compensation quite low anyway at $33,000, it would actually be $10,000 higher if employers were less concentrated. And that's not a little amount of money, right? As we all know, like $10,000 a year is a, is a really big difference. So this is definitely impacting the bottom lines of individuals and families. Uh, less purchasing power, you know, also consolidation just impacts like how much we're able to buy with the money we are earning when there is this much power um, within a limited set of entities. Smaller share of profits over the past 30 years, workers are also just getting less of the, the money that is being made. And again, as we've seen during the pandemic, profits are off the charts in a lot of these consolidated industries. And even though the profits are increasing that again, that percentage going to workers is not. Um, and it's actually less than it used to be. So that's another byproduct of this. And then less innovation, which I think is another interesting one because I mean, certainly one of the key stories we like to tell ourselves as Americans is this is the land of entrepreneurs and you can just like get your idea and find your parents' garage and make it happen. Um, but you know, even if we have the example of a unicorn now and then, like we've had a couple in Columbus, right? Like Root Insurance, for example, um, cover my meds. Uh, you know, these are exceptions to what has been a broader trend that as is innovation killing and that we haven't had um, as many startups as we used to have in the 70s and, and the startup rate is actually half of what it used to be. So um, that's looking at, you know, not just we, we need to stay focused, not just on the exceptional, like amazing case that hits a billion, but also like that we're having a lot fewer medium sized business, smaller businesses that are able to start, survive, grow as a result of the increase of concentration in the market. And then also less, you know, less of investment in research and development. Um, this is the other thing that we'll often hear is, oh, but you know, company or large corporations making a lot of money, Wall Street's financing it, but it's all going back and feeding growth and, and innovation. But actually um, we're seeing that you know, there, there's actually less money being spent on, for that purpose, more on things that take advantage of the financialization of our markets like stock buybacks. And so we're not really feeding the, the money that is coming in into further idea generation and innovation. Um, and then also subsidy extraction, which I'll let Pat, I'll let Pat talk. <laughs> Pat, if you want to say something Thanks. about that. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for doing this. I've been to Columbus a few times. It is lovely. I watched my New Jersey Devils lose very badly to the Columbus Blue Jackets in your arena. Um, so it's really cool to be here. Um, yeah, subsidy extraction, one of the... Uh, major consequences of all this concentration, as we have seen innovation drop, as you've seen small business formation drop, um, is that big corporations are able to play states off against each other in a competition to get subsidies, regulatory favors, cheap land, whatever the case may be, because the few jobs that they say they create are treated as, real, as precious commodities by lawmakers. We can get much deeper into this, but that has been one of the byproducts is as companies have consolidated and there have been fewer and fewer big companies able to make the sort of investments that might create jobs, states start essentially trying to bribe them to move around. This is something Ohio is very familiar with, whether it's Lordstown, whether it's the Sherwin-Williams headquarters, um, this is something that, that has really affected the state. So we can talk more about it later, but it is a byproduct of the concentration causing a drop in small business formation, causing a drop in innovation. There just aren't as many places uh, to go. So you, you end up having states throwing money at corporations and saying, please do something for us. Great. And so how did we, how did we get to this place? Um, you know, there are a few factors that we would identify. And so one is this rise of the consumer welfare standard. I've referenced a few times how there's been kind of a shift in things over the course of a generation or the last you know, 30 to 40 years. And that tracks pretty closely with uh, the beginning of the Reagan era and a real change in ideology of, you know, what antitrust is supposed to be about and also, um, you know, what types of um, mergers or acquisitions we could consider to be problematic or anti-competitive. And a lot of that gets at this, you know, this thing called the consumer welfare standard, which is really focused, we could, and we have colleagues who could like give a whole, uh, <laughs> lecture on that alone, but um, but just to keep it pretty simple, you know, it's it was this movement away from you know looking at markets as a whole and how you know different companies or market players might be interacting with each other to this real focus on 
price. And as long as prices were staying low for consumers and thinking of, of people or the impact really focused on our role as consumers, then things were more or less good and growth was you know, related more to efficiency and, and, and that sort of thing um, than other harms, you know, like the type that we identified earlier. And so you know, once this started to really get uh, solidified in court cases and um, the jurisprudence, it made it very difficult to challenge any mergers that were coming. And that, you know, that kind of explains some of this acceleration that we've seen in, in acquisitions and the growth of, you know, large corporations getting even larger. And that also is connected to enforcers. So those, you know, especially at the federal level, though, um, Pat's going to continue to just touch on the state and local application of this. We have enforcers at places like the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice that have one like embodied this ideology as well in, in their analysis, um, but then also even when they are bringing cases that will challenge mergers or you know, try to make the case for why they're not competitive, um, that they won't have much success in court because the, the way that the precedent has been established now just makes it very difficult to, to challenge them. Um, and then also, you know, linking to the, the influence and in, in the democracy side of things, uh, there's been a real loosening, as I'm sure a lot of folks are aware, in campaign finance restrictions. And we'll, we'll talk some more about that. But it's just enabled, like once you do attain this market power um, and you have the resources, then you can plug a lot of those resources into driving the political process because there aren't a lot of rules <laughs> left in, in a lot of ways there. Um, and then, and yeah, like Pat, I don't know if you want to add any on those three or, and also just touch a little bit on um, the yeah, dynamic absolutely. at the local level. Yeah, and this is all sort of trickled down to the state and local level. And particularly once you get to that level, you're often dealing with part-time legislatures, you're dealing with folks who can't pay for a lot of staff. Um, and so those those problems um, manifest in even greater ways. You'll see situations in, in plenty of states where lobbyists are literally the ones writing the bills and just handing them to state lawmakers to introduce. And it's because of the confluence of campaign finance, of, of just there being too much money flowing around. Um, and this idea that corporations are the ones who build the economy, that it's not the people, that it's not the workers, that it's not elected officials setting the rules, that it is just the corporations and that they essentially are the economy. So you see this deference and the idea that we need to go begging corporations to create jobs and give them whatever they want because that they're our only hope. Um, and, and it's because of this story that the, what I did in my book, which is available at the Bexley Library, is track how this myth was built, the myth that state and local economies are built by corporations first and people second. Um, and it's, it's really taken root. It's really believed at a sort of gut level by a lot of people who operate in policy circles, by a lot of people who write about state and local policy. Um, and so one of the things we try and do is really shake that loose because it is a myth. Great. And I, I can't remember if I mentioned, but you know, we're, we're totally open to taking questions throughout. So if things come to you, I think um, Leanne's going to flag for us, but we're totally open there. So want to keep this interactive. It's Zoom Saturday, or it's not Saturday, but it feels like it should be because my God, we just spent all our time on Zoom. Okay. Uh, so, right. And then, you know, once this power is attained, how does it get deployed? Um, first, you know, just starting with politically. So we've already referenced this a little bit, the campaign contributions. And this is, this is the point I want to hit home. It's not just the campaign contributions, you know, with the, the PACs, the super PACs. So that alone would be a lot, right? The independent expenditures that we have no disclosure around, though. Hopefully we'll see some changes in that in, in HR one, the bill that's um, you know making it through the house, but uh, but we'll see. Uh, so that would do something there. But right now it's just like pretty much unlimited money that you can flood into campaigns, and then that combination with lobbying. And it's hard to <laughs> overstate just how fierce the lobbying efforts can be. Um, we we know this. We have examples of it locally. I know um, Pat's going to speak to this, but. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, it's an army, an army that can be deployed to execute a political goal um, at the drop of a hat. And it's hard for, you know, any, any like, especially a part-time legislature, for example, but even a full-time one with staff to sometimes like weed through what's true, what's not, even if you have the best of intentions and are really trying to look out for the public interest. Um, and, you know, and, and it's not just elected officials, it's also um, regulators. So the people that can come and speak to folks that are working at the FTC and, and make their case from industry. This is something I saw directly at Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as well. Um, and then also, oh, 
Go ahead. I was just going to just, you had mentioned the COVID relief bill, I think, and we had a question in the chat. Are there any um, especially outrageous corporate subsidies that have been slipped in to the bill or maybe any recent like legislation that we, that you kind of flagged or that we should be aware of? That's a good question, Morgan. I can take that unless you- Yeah, no, no, to. please go ahead. Um, so not in the most recent one, as far as I know, and it did just pass. And so we haven't like gotten all the way through it, but this one um, is looking pretty good. But previous iterations of um, COVID relief were in fact, very, very, very corporate friendly. Uh, the CARES Act um, gave a lot of pretty much credit. It wasn't so much straight subsidies, but it changed the market structure in such a way that because the Federal Reserve was there and ready, to intervene, they, they almost didn't have to. Um, whereas like, the small business, the, the program that was uh, meant to aid small businesses, the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, was really janky and hard to understand. And lots of businesses had had trouble um, navigating it. And the money first had to go through banks um, and particularly big banks who didn't necessarily have great relationships with small businesses. And I actually think that's a great question because it is a perfect example of what we're talking about where the big guys get one set of rules to play by and the little guys get it uh, a different set of rules and a much more difficult set of rules. Mm -hmm. Not just the real little guys. You know, I think a lot of times too, we think about this, it's like, oh, it's like we're talking mom and pop retailers or, you know, Anheuser-Busch. It's like, there's actually a lot of like pretty big businesses uh, that are, you know, consider, I guess, medium-sized businesses or whatever that are also finding it very difficult to compete and, and don't have the same level of influence or power to make sure that, um, that these bills reflect you know, their interests as well and, and breed a more competitive market. So that's actually, that's actually a really good point, something we're working on a set of bills at the state level at the moment. One of the things we're seeing with it is that pretty big businesses are under the thumb of Apple and Google and are saying, we can't access our customers without going through Apple and Google and they extract these huge fees and it's really unfair. And these are like big guys wouldn't say it's like, oh, it's not the hardware store down the street. Um, but even they are affected by the power that the, the handful of dominant corporations at the top have. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, you know, just to touch on very briefly, like we have here about government appointees. I don't know how familiar folks are with this concept of like revolving door. Um, I think that too, sometimes like the narrative around that can get somewhat distorted where it's like, oh, it's just like, you know, being very, um, I don't know, like, progressives or whatever that are just like so hardcore and uncompromising about who they want in certain positions. It's like, well, you know, where that's coming from is it's not only that you maybe are going to be proactively negative or do things that are, you know, directly harmful, but folks who have made money in a, in a big chunk of their careers of defending the same corporations that are dominating markets that we think need to be addressed to make the landscape more competitive might just be less inclined to be as aggressive, right? Or like a little bit more friendly towards the status quo. And, um, and that can ultimately be just as harmful in certain ways um, because these, these trends go unchecked and, and as we see, they're causing a lot of harms. Um, oh yeah, and then, you know, state level here, Alec, I don't know if, Pat, you wanna talk a little bit about the last two? Um, yeah, so I mean, you see organizations like Alec, which is a conservative organization that does sort of model legislation, um, usually very corporate friendly, that it you know spreads around and moves from state to state. Um, and then again, selling this myth that um, corporations are the be all end all of building a local economy. So they'll come riding in and say, you know, we are going to be great for your community, give us X million dollars and don't make us do an environmental review on our plant and we will create all these jobs and everything will be fantastic. And they often break those promises. And again, this is something Ohio has experience with, with the Lordstown plant and credit to your attorney general actually for going and saying, you guys broke your promise and please give us at least some of that money back. Um, but that happens all over the country all the time, every day. And oftentimes there aren't people that are willing to go and say, actually, you broke your promises. Um, so you need to, to recoup some of that money. They just sort of are able to waltz off with, with taxpayer funds and then cut the jobs and then do mergers that result in layoffs and on and on and on. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that, and that's also another thing, just in terms of the politics around these issues, um, there are a lot of interesting bipartisan opportunities that, I think would be very relevant. Oh, did I do that? Oh, if I did, I didn't mean to. Wait, where is this going? We're going backwards. I know we're going hey, backwards. What's happening? Okay, there we go. I'm like, wait, okay, sorry. <laughs> we're back. Um, but yeah, no, anyway, the, the bipartisan 
opportunities here, I think are big and, and that could be really important, you know, in a place like Ohio for us. So um, cool. Okay. So, you know, that we just talked about like deploying uh, politically and influencing government actors, but also like this power gets deployed in economic terms, right. And, and within the market. And, you know, just to touch on one of the really live examples right now, big tech, like how does this play out once you've accumulated um, or acquired this type of market power, how are you able to wield it to, you know, hurt other competitors or, or whatever. So take, for example, big tech, big tech, when we say that we're kind of referring to big four companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, um, and they are considered big because they are so dominant. And then, you know, in addition to being dominant from, you know, a market share perspective in terms of how much of the market that they control in the various industries that they're in, but also just how long they've sustained that market share. Like these are the, some of the factors that um, or considered in, in defining something as being kind of dominant. Um, but what's unique about the big tech firms is also this idea of gatekeeping power. And so, you know, when this is something that was a subject of this very comprehensive and actually one of like the most comprehensive anti-monopoly efforts that Congress has done in the past 50 years that the antitrust subcommittee led um, and released a report on last fall, it's getting at, you know, this idea of gatekeeping power that not only are you dominant in your like core business line. So if we're talking about um, like Amazon, for example, okay, Amazon runs this marketplace, they're dominant in that, but you're also moving into different functions entirely. So sticking with the Amazon example, they run the marketplace, but also have this whole other private label business where they're actually creating products, right? And they are able to use the massive data collection that they are able to get through the marketplace to then determine, well, what products on our marketplace are actually doing pretty well? And if there's one of those, like, um, I know an example that, <laughs> that we bring up, like a great luggage company that's really cool and innovative and getting a lot of traction, it's like, people seem to like that. We know that because we run the marketplace, let's just make one of our own. And also we kind of can control how these things come up in the search results and also what ad might drive you to which product prioritize our version of this really cool new innovative product and push theirs down to like third page of search results and good luck innovative luggage company that had a cool idea we win you lose see you later um that is creeping into this idea of like gatekeeping power that in the past uh when we've encountered we i say as a american democratic institutions of government um you know, we, when we've encountered that like railroads where there was a similar dynamic going on that, you know, we had large railroad trusts that were controlling the rails, but then also tried to get into the business of deciding who gets to be on the rails and that they kind of want to be on the rails companies that they control. We said, er, like, this is too much. This is like completely out of bounds, not competitive. And it's, we're going to design solutions that, um, you know, address this specific market issue and where there's extreme power. And so that's what is happening right now with these big tech companies. There's a real um, referendum on just how much power they have, how it gets deployed, how they're able to like push other players out of the market, whether they're in a, if they're in adjacent markets or totally different business lines. And, you know, it's these conflicts of interest that are within their business models that allow them to have these incentives that really just prevent this, this market um, from being fair or anybody else really having a, a fair shot. And so, you know, the antitrust subcommittee did an investigation that really detailed this. It's like 500 pages. If you're really, really, you know, feeling like you're having a slow Zoom day and want to like take uh, the temperature a bit, make through, make your way through that report. But um, we also have a lot of, you know, documents on our website that kind of like give a, a good flavor for what this is all about um, and will save you from having to go through the whole thing. And then also, you know, there are enforcement cases. We're going to get into some of the tools that are available now, but just like, you know, other mechanisms for addressing this type of gatekeeping power. There are enforcement cases that are coming up through the FTC, through the DOJ, and also at the state level as well. So anyway, but like in terms of just giving you a, a flavor for how that power can be deployed and why it's so problematic and makes it difficult for other market players to be competitive, big tech is a, is a, pretty, um, a pretty key example right now. Oh, wait, that's not the next slide. Oh, Oh, wait, sorry, I changed the order. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I actually, I think it'll be better to go to Pat. So Pat, you know, talk about how this gets deployed at the state and local level. Yeah, so you see a lot of the, the same dynamics. So the first thing I've talked about is that corporations riding into town and saying, please give us money because we are gonna create jobs and we're your only hope for um, 
having an economy at all. And you often see this with uh, big tech companies where an Amazon will come in or a Facebook or a, or a Google. And oftentimes they're not for the sort of tech jobs that you associate with Silicon Valley. It's for the supporting stuff. It's for the warehouses. It's for the data centers um, and, and those sort of things that are the infrastructure for the company. But because they they say, you know, we're big tech, we're creating jobs, we're growing, we're one of the only things that is, um, state lawmakers still feel compelled to um, do those companies favors, to give them um, taxpayer money to, to, to push through maybe problematic regulatory changes. Uh, but that's not the only thing. You're also seeing a push to change labor law. I don't know how many of you followed what's called, what's called Prop 22 in California, which, which was an effort by um, delivery, the um, ride-sharing companies, so like your Uber um, and, and those companies to change labor law in a way that makes it very difficult for their drivers to um, get paid in a fair way, to get fair benefits. Um, and an interesting part of that was that they also locked in political changes. It wasn't just about the economic changes around what the drivers could earn and how they could um, push forward disputes with the corporations. It also made changes um, to the political process saying that in order to change anything about this proposition, they now need super majorities in the California legislature. So it wasn't just uh, poli like policy towards workers and towards labor. It was also literally altering the political process so that workers have less power so that they need to get a larger group of legislators to re to undo these changes um, than for your normal um, political process. Um, and companies also build mini monopolies that are regional. You know, we talk about these big national corporations, but we see all the time sort of silly sounding monopolies in little areas. Like it was talking to a colleague earlier today who was looking into a monopoly in road salt in Minnesota because one guy is coming in and rolling up all of the companies that provide road salt to the towns in Minnesota. And so that's going to give that company more power to extract money from little towns, little communities that need salt in the winter. Um, so you see that sort of dynamic. It doesn't have to be nationwide. You can accumulate a lot of power in a local market um, by just rolling up a couple of companies. Um, and, and it's something we can talk about more later, but states also do have this similar set of powers to the federal government to do something about it. Yeah, and that's where I wanted to go next. So actually, I'm going to I don't agree with my reshuffling of these slides, so I'm going <laughs> to revert. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, like what can be done at the federal level? Um, so like I, I was saying, like structural solutions for specific markets. So taking big tech, like that's what a lot of the subcommittee's recommendations are getting at. And what we as an organization really support is this idea of uh, structural separations of companies or, you know, otherwise kind of known as breakups or referred to as breakups. And, you know, this isn't, it, it isn't, you know, done all the time, but there is a long history of doing this. Like I referenced railroads before. A lot of folks are probably aware, like AT&T, you know, there was like a, a complete um, restructuring there. And so that is something that we have done in the past to address this type of like market power, especially when it's the market power that's over critical infrastructure in our economy. Um, and so right now, this is where I think a lot of folks agree you know, you have to be, you have to be in on Amazon more or less, you know, especially a small business owner trying to get your product to market. So they're controlling like critical commerce and infrastructure. And then in the case of Facebook, Google, critical communications infrastructure um, in, in terms of dominating social media and for, you know, news publishers, for example, and then Apple on the like software development side of things, they're also quite dominant. So, you know, thinking about these solutions that are for specific markets where we have this extreme dominance is, is one key tactic. Um, and then also, you know, generally just enforcing fair competition goals at these agencies. Um, and big tech's the example we've mentioned a lot, but there, there's a, they actually have a lot of power at these agencies. You know, another effort of ours is to ask the FTC, and this is, I think we're going live with this tomorrow, um, but to ask the FTC to investigate the insulin, what we, we would describe as like an insulin cartel, more or less, but um, the fact that there are about four pharmaceutical companies that all change prices for insulin on the same day. Coincidence? Maybe, but probably not, right? And that doesn't seem very competitive. And also it's like deeply, deeply harmful to people's health and risking lives and um, you know, not able to afford a critical medication. And so that's something that the FTC could investigate now. They could then have that investigation, um, you know, lead to an enforcement action. And, uh, and that's certainly something that 
they haven't done a lot of uh, or and definitely enough of and that we're we're trying to encourage them to flex that muscle. Um, and so that's another critical appointment actually that's still very much live for the Biden administration is who, who is gonna be in the power positions at these agencies and will they go with what's done in the past um, that's been kind of like a status quo dominated by this consumer welfare ideology or are they going to actually get these agencies back into what has been their real you know, historic tradition of looking out aggressively for the public interest and making sure that these markets are competitive. Uh, and then also their, their enforcement. So their changes to actually like the uh, anti-monopoly law that has been kind of like, <laughs> we would say um, corrupted somewhat through some of these judicial decisions. It's actually one of our colleagues who's on the call, Matthew Buck is very focused on this in terms of like what those changes would look like to strengthen um, through law, what the courts have undone through their, their precedent. And so um, that's another critical piece that is part of the recommendations that the subcommittee has made that would apply to big tech, but also would uh, apply across a broader set of markets as well. And then, uh, you know, another point that we make, and this is one of our, our recent um, reports we put out is called Courage to Learn. And that goes through, like in some of these different markets that are quite concentrated, there are different parts of the federal bureaucracy that folks might not think of um, as having been, you know, that as having to be connected to monopoly or competition issues, but like Department of Agriculture, um, the FCC, like they, they all have a role to play in, in controlling for some of these uh, market power issues and, and helping to promote more competitive markets. And so we, we kind of encourage, you know, the federal bureaucracy and Biden administration to think about how um, to, to flex that um, authority as well. Okay, so now we're gonna, oh wait. And then, yeah, some state and local examples of how we can get the government focused on uh, addressing power issues, I will turn it back to Pat. Certainly. So, I mean, the the overarching thing at the at the state level is that most states have similar powers to the federal government. States have their own antitrust laws, and they can also enforce federal antitrust law. So, if you have a, a an aid like an AG who's interested in it. Um, she or he can challenge a merger on the grounds that it would be harmful to your state's consumers, or they can launch investigations into predatory tactics by um, corporations. And one good example that we uh, have been working on is around delivery apps. So these are your DoorDashes, your Uber Eats, your Grubhubs, um, the companies that act as a middleman between restaurants and their customers. They engage in a whole lot of predatory and abusive and coercive tactics toward the restaurants in order to get them um, to join the platforms in the first place. They charge incredibly high fees and there's a very simple role for the state and local government there to both regulate the fees and to regulate some of the, the contractual stuff um, and some of the practices. And one in particular is that um, the apps will often, if a restaurant hasn't signed up to be on the platform, they will scrape the restaurant's website, post the menu as if they have a relationship with the restaurant anyway. Um, and, and then when the restaurant calls and says, hey, my menu is posted on your website, but I'm not, I don't have an arrangement with you and my prices are wrong and I don't sell those items anymore. Like, what are you doing? Um, the app will say, oh, well, the only way you can change it is to sign up and start turning over 30% of your orders to us. Um, so that sort of stuff happens. And that's just a very simple thing that the AG can step in or state lawmakers can step in and say, you have to knock that off. You can't do that anymore um, because it's, it's a, just a simple predatory business practice. Um, step two is, um, if you're cleaning up local economic development, a huge problem at the state and local level is that you simply don't know what's happening. You don't know what sort of favors your lawmakers are doing for corporations. You don't know what sort of money is going out the door um, because they enforce non-disclosure agreements. They enforce non-competes. Um, they will often ask to change things like public records law to say that the corporation in question gets the first chance to respond to a Freedom of Information Act request um, if a citizen goes and tries to uh, get information about what the arrangement between a corporation and a town is. So cleaning that stuff up and getting it out of your state and city codes um, is really important in step one to just figuring out what the problem is. So then you can move on and start doing some of the, the other things to actually address the, um, the business model, but you, ne you need to know about it first. Yeah, 
Well, yeah, and another one that came up with a non-compete that I thought was very interesting today in the healthcare space, just to make the point, it is like it's, you know, professionals of all levels that this is impacting. Um, but, you know, a lot of doctors now are part of larger hospital monopolies and systems, and they will impose, there was actually one in, um, I think, Allegheny County in Pittsburgh that was enforcing a non-compete against doctors a year long, you know, non-compete and, but they were the only medical system really that was employing anyone in the county. And so it took a county executive that was like, no, we're not going to let you do this to free up doctors to be able to pursue alternative um, employment, you know, within a year. So it's just, it's really pervasive, like this type of um, power and how it gets wielded. In, and one in of the, one content. of the wild ones is there are not competes that are not just for workers, but for the state itself. If there are, there have been instances and one I'm thinking it was in North Carolina where a corporation agreed to, 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 build a road and to um, set up some toll booths, but they inserted into the contract that the state could literally not change the road or add new exits or do anything that would reduce business through these toll booths for 50 years. So it was a non-compete with the state. The state was not allowed to compete with the infrastructure that it paid for. It's crazy. <laughs> and you see this stuff all over all the time. I mean, the non-disclosure agreements too, where Amazon will come in and say, we want $10 million for a uh, a warehouse, but you can't say that it's Amazon. You have to say that you're giving $10 million to Project Olive or Project Phoenix. They always pick like sort of innocuous, goofy sounding names. Um, and, and the local officials abide by these non-disclosure agreements. When a journalist goes and asks, hey, what are you giving $10 million for? They say, oh, it's Project Olive. I don't know who's behind it. Who can tell? We had a question um, in the chat. So, um, so Andrew asked, uh, do the speakers support limiting political power that is exercised through labor unions, such as AARP, NAACP, et cetera, and other non-business groups that organize and use their money to influence political outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I don't, I don't know that we have an organizational position on that. I guess I'll like, I'll say my thought and, and let Pat um, say his, but, you know, I, I think a lot of what we're getting at is like not not trying, and, and this, it, the question kind of reminds me of like the censorship, censorship issue around some of the social media platforms. It's like not getting in the business so much of like saying who can do what, but like creating guardrails that just make like what any individual organization or platform or whatever is able to do on its own, right? And so, um, you know, I think it's more important that we have transparency around like where those groups, like where there's money, where is their money coming from? What are they using it for rather than like banning certain groups or organizations altogether? Um, I don't know, that's, that's kind of my thought, but I'll let, Pat, I'll let Pat respond as well. Yeah, I mean like, you know, unions are the traditional counterweight to a lot of what we're talking about, but because there has been so much anti-labor um, legislation at the federal and, and um, state level, uh, that counterweight has gone away. So you can track a lot of what we're talking about to the decline of labor unions. You can track a lot of the decline in wages to the decline of labor unions. Um, so I think things you can do to promote that at all levels would actually help us achieve some of the things we're talking about because you know that was the traditional um, way in which uh, some of the more pernicious practices of these corporations were reined in was because they had to be accountable to their workers in a way that they don't today. Well, and that's what's so interesting too about the, Am I don't know if folks are following like what's going on in, in Alabama with the Amazon employees, but you know, already people are saying like they're seeing that they're getting traction and organizing a union and it's inspiring other warehouse workers in other parts of the country to realize like, oh wait, like we also have power. Like we also should maybe consider these unionizing efforts. So um, a lot of what we're getting at is just like the recognition of at individual citizen level of, you know, organizational level of government elected officials understanding the power that they have and just using it. Yeah, an interesting story on that actually um, that I was looking into a little this week is that one of the reasons that Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley in the first place was because California didn't allow non-competes at those early tech firms. They said that those tech workers had to be allowed to jump firm to firm or to jump and start their own company. So the state stepped in and said, we want to have an innovative, open, market here for tech ideas. And that's not the only reason, but that is one of the reasons why Silicon Valley is what it is today was because the state said, we want to encourage the good practices that build new firms, that build small businesses that allow innovation to occur. Great. 
Okay. So yeah. What do you do with all of this? I know I, <laughs> I talked to some people about this. They're just like, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. Where do you go from here? Well, we have some concrete places to go. So first, uh, you know, certainly one of our goals, I would say is like that this starts to influence how you make voting choices and, and who you're electing and, um, and forcing folks to talk about how they would use their position to um, address, you know, market issues and, and corporate power. And so, you know, that's something we actually have also done. So, you know, American Economic Liberties is a C3. We have a C4 arm that's called um, Fight Corporate Monopolies. And that did some investments in races where there was like a corporate power related issue. Um, Corey Bush's race, for example, you know, running an ad there that showed how her opponent in Missouri Again, like not, you know, necessarily being like proactively introducing legislation that was enabling certain things for corporation, but actually just like slowing down the progress of a bill that would have addressed or, or made fiduciaries like folks who are managing retirement accounts uh, more transparent and, and, and more um, have greater obligations to their clients. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that we want to make sure this is mainstream in that way that folks are considering these types of issues or decisions or lack of decisions that their elected officials have made when choosing who to vote for. And like Pat's been been hitting um, hitting this point that it's at all levels, really, right? This is not just a federal issue. Our city council members, our county officials, our state officials also should have thoughts on how they're gonna use their position to address this issue. Um, and then also, you know, it's possible to just identify this anti-competitive behavior yourself, you know, whether a business owner, we're actually working on putting together an event that's related to the healthcare industry. And I've been talking to uh, a mask, uh, a, a guy who's a senior official and a mask manufacturer who has been sounding the alarm over 13 years about how, you know, he felt like this market was not competitive, it was actually being dominated by foreign, uh, foreign owned companies, which is like slightly different issue. We haven't talked about too much, but um, but, you know, was going to, to his Congress people and being like, hey, you need to look into this, like you got to address this. And similarly, you know, reporting this type of anti-competitive behavior to a regulator, to a congressperson, um, you know, is something that then could lead them to address, you know, have a staff person investigate it and possibly, you know, eventually lead to some kind of bill or something. So that is, or just contact us and then we can help to <laughs> guide you through the process or take it to the, the right person. And then, you know, just to generally stay up to date on these issues, there are some, you know, key resources. We've already referenced Pat's book and also his newsletter, um, but big, uh, one of our colleagues, Matt Stoller, who's the head of research at Economic Liberties, does a newsletter big that is really good at just like breaking down a lot of these issues in an easy to understand way. Um, and that's something you could subscribe to. And then, you know, checking out our website, which probably should have made more explicit in this presentation, but I'll just say it, <laughs> uh, economicliberties.us. Um, we have a lot of materials that I think are really clear for someone who doesn't necessarily have a strong background in the issues to, to understand more and help it, like we said, ultimately inform you know, your voting decisions, which I think is, is the most powerful way that we can get traction on this. And with that, I believe we're at the end. So yeah, I don't know if folks have additional questions. Okay, yeah. Um, let me go ahead and I will share my screen now. Let me see. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading a question from the chat. Okay, we'll start with this one from Scott. Um, the city of Bexley offer property tax abatements and payroll tax in incentives to drive reinvestment in the community. What warning flags may be present when project proposals start heading into dangerous waters? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that is one of the most um, pernicious um, giveaways at the, the um, state and local level, because as I'm sure you all know, property taxes um, fund schools, like straight up, that is, that is school money. So if those, um, uh, giveaways don't pay off if they don't create the sort of economic growth and jobs and income growth or whatever that they're supposed to. That's literally money out of the classroom and oftentimes they don't. Um, the first warning flag is really just to see which company is and if it would be coming to Bexley anyway, because you, the, the academic research on this shows that 75 to 98% of the time a company re receives some sort of benefit from the state or city like that, um, they would have done what they were going to do in any case without the incentive. So that's thing one. 
does the company have um, other um, like structures nearby? Do they have other business in the area? Are there logistics or supply chain reasons to be where they are? Look for the sort of things that would show that it needs to be there no matter what. Um, so that's thing one. And then, and honestly, just the, 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 the largest flag that this is gonna be a waste is if there are good business reasons for um, the company to be there. And, and that actually gets into some of the, the myth building that I, I, I talk about in the book and I've talked about a little bit here is, um, corporate interests became very good at convincing everybody that taxes were the one thing that really determined where they were going to go. Um, and it's not, there are tons and tons and tons of factors that go into any particular location decision. Um, but corporations, because they're interested in it, and then too many lawmakers and journalists and whoever treat it as if that cost, that cost factor is the only thing driving any corporate decision. Like we saw it with Amazon with HQ2 when it had literally hundreds of cities around the country jumping to throw literally billions of dollars at this new Amazon headquarters. And where does it go? It goes to New York, the world capital of finance and Washington DC, the literal seat of the government. They were gonna go to those two places. I, I can't prove it. I don't have Jeff Bezos on my cell phone but they were gonna go to those two places no matter what. That sort of dynamic also occurs at the local level. Why does this developer want to be here? Are there reasons for the developer or whatever the thing in question um, to be here because it makes good business business sense and has nothing to do with the government? Okay, great. All right, uh, so here's another question. What are some ways the government has tried to regulate these conglomerates, if at all, and has it worked? Hmm. Well, you know, so I referenced a couple of historic, um, historical examples of when the government has addressed these consult like extreme market power and consolidation issues, and it and it has worked. Uh, you know, so like the railroads, for example, like if it if we had kind of like stayed on the road that they were trying to do, you know, it's not clear that as many businesses would have had access to this key infrastructure that enabled transporting goods and, and building business. So the fact that we had, you know, we addressed that issue and then led to broader economic growth, um, I would think is evidence that this kind of thing works. But one, one thing that I would also note here, and this is a really key point, and it's really key in the big tech fight that's, that's live right now in Congress, is we would kind of say like, there's a difference here between like the structural separation piece and regulation. And actually it's extremely difficult to effectively regulate a conglomerate um, once it's attained this level of market power. And so, you know, how do we know that? Okay, so we can take a look at actually, you know, sticking with the big tech example, like the EU has tried different um, individual regulatory approaches around like privacy, um, for example. And, you know, what's occurred is one, either sometimes these regulations are just like ignored. That actually gets at the Prop 22 example that, um, that Pat was mentioning more stateside, but in the EU privacy example, or because they already are so dominant, they're able to comply with some of these regulations in a way that smaller or medium sized players are not. And it just actually helps to further entrench their market power. And so, you know, what, that's why we think it's so important, you know, especially when we have this like extreme dominance is first to structurally separate and then we can regulate because before that regulation isn't really going to be all that effective because they just, you know, either will be able to entrench further or actually ignore regulation and do what they want and, and overcome the rule of law. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen um, because we have another question from the chat, which is really great. Um, so um, the comment about the col um, collaborate, yeah, I'm so sorry, the comment about the collaborated price change in insulin um, made this guest think about the fiasco regarding uh, Parlay or Parlor. It's Parlor, isn't it? It's not French. Parlor. Um, yeah. Uh, now, as much as I mean, um, <laughs> I haven't heard that, but that's a good. <laughs> right. Yeah. As much as I, may, um, the person says, as much as I may disagree with the content um, that may have been shared on that platform, wasn't it basically a collaboration of the monopolies um, that have this policing authority in the market that eventually led to dismembering a competitor? Uh, is there any actions that are being taken to influence policies to better protect new businesses and even individuals? Um, and then just so I can get this other question out there, um, Keith asks, are buy American programs good subsidies or bad subsidies? Those are two separate questions. So 
I'll take the first one and I'll let Matt take the second one. So the parlor one is very interesting. And actually we spent a lot of time talking about this internally. Um, I recently had to testify before Congress on the big tech issues and we prepared for this question because um, it, is, it is actually getting at a lot of the core issues. So one, I would just like, I would make a slight correction to the description of the issue and that I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think we would describe Parler as a competitor to uh, Facebook or, you know, any of these other dominant platforms. It, there are no competitors. Like they are dominant. You can't compete. That is like a core thing to understand. And so things like Parler, Clubhouse, which is kind of, you know, big right now among some, um, they aren't really competing. They're in like one content area and they're up against a giant. And so um, that's just, you know, just kind of clarifying there. But what's interesting about the part thing, I agree with you, content gross, right? Like that isn't, that isn't really aligning with, you know, my personal values. And I think of values of a lot of people, but do we really want like a small group of billionaires, uh, you know, deciding like who gets to be heard and who doesn't and, and making those types of calls? We would say, no, like actually that is problematic to have these players that have that much power. And if we address some of these structural issues that create their dominance, then we don't have to even get to that question of did these you know, tech giants make the right call? It's like their calls are less important and influential because they're not controlling you know, critical infrastructure. And so once we have a more competitive market, the ability to like spread these types of negative messages and also control you know, who's in, who's out is just weakened and overall um, less of a concern. So. I don't know if, uh, but but anyway, well, actually one, one last thing I'd say there, but that politically that's very tricky. And so, you know, what the position I've just described, there are a lot of Republicans actually that would agree with that position. And there are Republicans like Jim Jordan, for example, that I think kind of agree with that position, even if their motivation for maybe landing on that decision are different. And that's what I, I was referencing about the politics around some of these um, competition antitrust issues is just very interesting right now because there are Republicans that are on the right side of the competition issue, though their motivations we wouldn't agree with. And then sometimes we're finding that folks who, you know, maybe are more progressive don't quite have that same analysis. But I really think of it as more of like an education issue. And, and once you kind of understand like the market dynamics at play, I think um, a lot of folks do land on, you know, the position that we're describing. Yeah, so by American, that's a uh, that's a good question, and I think like ultimately they they can be, and that this gets at the question of designing um, the economy to work in a certain way, and lawmakers' honest fears of doing that, of saying, hey, this is something we believe in in terms of the the values essentially that our economy should have. Um, the like sort of modern era of buy American, they're really Swiss cheesy and like they don't actually like enforce it. But I think if you are saying there's value in having American manufacturing and having American supply chains and in having products made here and shipped here and built here, and then that's good. And if we're going to enforce labor standards in those deals and not allow monopolies to grow so that suppliers can continue to do their thing and so that small business can invade. Yes, I think they can be very good because you're trying to build up um, capacity in areas that we just don't have. And one of the really terrible trends of the last several decades has been the outsourcing and the offshoring of a lot of our manufacturing capacity and our industrial capacity. Like we just don't make semiconductors in the US anymore, even though they go into everything. Um, we're really dependent on, on Taiwan in particular, which is not a great place to be dependent on given its relationship with China. So if you're saying we're gonna use these sort of um, laws to force internal, um, the, the building of internal capacity to make certain critical things, yes, absolutely. I think they can be very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I know it's getting on eight o'clock. We have um, basically like two more questions. Do you want to? Okay. So um, a big question was how has COVID um, impacted or exasperated the consolidation problem? Um, and then we also have a question about um, what do you think is the impact of media corporations? I think you mentioned this a little bit with AT&T. Um, but media corporations and conglomerates like Disney, CBS, and News Corp. Um, we talked about political power and like paying to talk directly to the government, but um, on more of a control of the culture, I guess, like, is there anything that you want to say about, about that? 
Uh, and yeah, and now I'm blanking on what was the first question. <laughs> sorry. Oh, the, the first question was COVID. Oh, COVID. COVID. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right, right, right. Um, consol yeah, consolidation. Sorry. I'm not a night person. Um, okay. So yeah, on COVID, actually, a lot of this has been accelerated. And I don't know if we've released, did we already release the, the update to the merger tracker? I'm not remembering. But anyway, we if we haven't already, um, we're soon releasing just like a, a documentation of just like how many more mergers there have been. Um, over the past year and then also during the Trump administration. Um, and yeah, it, it has accelerated for sure. And we, we kind of keep like a running channel going of just like the different acquisitions that are announced and it's pretty wild. It's hard, if you, if you focus on just trying to keep up with that, it'll, it'll take up, you know, a good amount of your time. So um, we have seen that. Uh, and, you know, it's also been interesting, like some of the media coverage of other effects during COVID beyond just like literally how consolidation is impacting the health outcomes related to COVID and the treatment of patients and nurses and workers within, within hospitals, um, but also just like prices of things going up, you know, on basic household items. That's also something that we're seeing. You take a neighborhood that maybe only has one retail provider to begin with, and then they're able to jack up prices and there's nowhere else to go. Um, that gets at that like purchasing power impact and harm. That's, that's very real. And I think has gotten worse during COVID. Um, yeah. What? Okay. Yeah. Oh. If I can, if I could add okay. on. To Matthew that, Buck just um, put a link to the thing that I was. It's referencing. so good. Matt is here. We would be sunk without him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and like conversely, yeah, you've seen you're seeing this merger spree amongst the sort of bigger companies. But I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this in your community. Small businesses crushed. You know, restaurants, small stores. Um, have not weathered this well at all. So you're going to see this situation in which the sort of bottom of the business economy is just gone um, because the supports there have been, you know, bad to non-existent. Um, so while there's going to be a lot of churn and growth and whatever at the top, the sort of thing, the sort of businesses that are active in the communities and that provide local culture um, have been really, really hurt and there has not been enough done to help them. And there was another, sorry, okay, now, in second. Question two is about like entertainment, right? Oh, the entertainment, oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay, and that was- Disney that, owns everything. Yes, Disney what owns about everything, it? right? Well, yeah, and, and I know we have a whole section encouraged to learn about uh, media and the impacts of that and actually like specific recommendations for what the next administration should do about that. But yeah, we, that, that is definitely a, a trend and it's making me think of like the Comcast example um, where that's where like we actually, you know, Comcast, huge conglomerate, and also um, had a, a suit that went up to the Supreme Court that was saying, you know, they were actually like discriminating against um, black owned businesses that were creating black content. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, it plays out in, in interesting ways in the media market too. But I don't know, Pat, if you want to add yeah, more. I mean, yeah, one of the wild stats of the last bunch of years is that while on the surface, it seems like there have never been, there's never been more entertainment rate made, right? Like you, everybody's streaming everything. There's Netflix, there's Hulu, there's Amazon Prime, it's everywhere. Pay to the creators of that content, to the writers and the people who make these shows has been going down. So even though there's more and more and more content coming out and people are paying more and more and more for it, that's not winding up with the content creators. And it's because of exactly this problem that you identified that you have a few dominant corporations that own everything at the top and that are keeping all of the money at the top. Yeah, and that's that harm we talked about earlier, like the share of profit is decreasing. Um, and again, yeah, it's like employees, workers, and also creatives, you know, different types of professionals as well. So it's, it really is, I mean, it's, it's like there's a small number at the top that's benefiting and then the rest of us. And, um, and so that's where I do think there's a real political opportunity just to wrap, wrap things up. That is by part, like we're not, this isn't partisan. This is, this is technically what we say this country is about. It's like democracy and freedom and competition. And we have gotten so far from that in our economy and it's influencing our politics that, um, you know, trying to educate folks about this issue, I do think has real electoral possibilities. And, and so I hope that everyone leaves with, with that spirit in mind and, um, and, and a better understanding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there, yeah, I could, I don't think there's any more questions. So um, thank you so much for joining us.
Um, and thank you to everyone in the meeting. We really appreciate your participation. Um, and like Beth said, you can um, find out more about any of our events. You do register for all of them. They will be virtual um, for the rest of spring and probably into summer. You can find them at bexleylibrary.org and you can follow the library across the platforms um, at Bexley Library. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.